everyone to this really exciting forum. Uh, I'm just going to do a few introductions and then we'll get going. So my name is Moira, I've been a socialist and a teacher trade humanist for quite a long time now and I'm really proud to say that in the last year I've been on strike fighting against teacher shortages and fighting for better pay for teachers across the UK. <laughs> when the world is facing multiple crises. The climate crisis, Covid, the cost of living crisis and a world economic system that could be leading into recession. And we have a desperate need for solutions. And it's a crisis that is posing that question to people the world over. Who is going to pay for the crisis? And in our context, the question of who should pay for the crisis is one that is being posed in Australia. Our bosses have very clear answers. We see their answers in the continued planning and opening of new mines uh, across the country. In the absolute joke of the climate bill that is currently going through Parliament. In the record high profits of 400 and 25 billion of the energy companies in 2021 to 22. And the ideological assault that wages cause inflation. When, women in, when living standards of Australian workers have fallen and are set to fall further. We see what the answer is from the rich in our country and around the world. It's profits for them, pay cuts for us as it has been throughout the last two and a half years of the COVID pandemic. And this is a time where class war is being waged by the bosses in the open. And time for our side to join the fray with the determination and the panache of the Sri Lankan protesters <laughs> occupying the swimming pool and the gym of their president's palace. <laughs> So tonight's panel, our free workers in Sydney, who are definitely doing their bit to promote the level of class struggle on our side, and I'm really proud to call these people my comrades. I'm going to introduce them one by one as they speak, but just before they do that, it's a really great honour to have Jeremy Heathcote here, who is going to do the acknowledgement of country. Jeremy is a proud Aboriginal man of Arabaco Nation. He works at Sydney Uni and is an active member of the branch committee at NTU Fight Back. And as well as being a unionist that led the first nation strike at UCID in May, he's the local community leader. Thank you, Jeremy. Where we are today, 
why did we do targets? So they won't do enforceable targets at two scale. But my view, I've talked to people about that. If you move forward, I don't care. If you get one extra person to show you doing something, that's why it's really important. Um, where we are today, it's, like I said, it's Aboriginal land, but I always have respect to those around us too. So the west of us, we've got the Wongal, Barramatta, Mugdurrick, um, north, um, Kamaragu, and Kringai people. To the south, we've got the Ewan um, community as well, um, Pidgewood community, in the southwest, um, again, the Gara. The reason I mention them as well as here is because we used to come together as Aboriginal people. Um, I hear it, we're coming together to today, and work together on a range of things. So it's really important that we do pay respects to all of those communities um, and the elders past, present and emerging. Um, without one elder, Uncle Charles, I wouldn't be part of you, you wouldn't be activists. Um, I met him in a student strike many, many years ago. And he said to me, um, always strike for your people, put your people first. Um, Aboriginal people, look at Redfern, that's where our rights came from, the strikes. Um, students who struck, struck here with Uncle Charles, for example, and that freedom ride, we wouldn't have that referendum. I was only 10 years before I was born. I wouldn't be classified as a person as a citizen of that country. So it's really important we do come together and work together. Um, it's important that we do honour this land um, and tread carefully on the land when you get back home as well. Um, and one thing I always do, if you don't know much about you, where you're from, where your land is, learn. Um, learn about the history, the good and bad. Um, and it's really important to remember that. So thank you everyone. So it's just pretty great to be back here on the country. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. As I said, for our meeting tonight, we've got a panel of three trade unionists and fighters, and each of them will speak for about 12 minutes. After that, there will be time for questions and contributions, but I do ask you to save those until after the three speakers uh, have spoke. There will also be a couple of quick announcements about events coming forward. So, our first speaker is Damien Ridgewell. He works as a train driver, at Sydney Trains Central Depot. He's been a delegate since 2018 and the lead de driver's delegate at Central since 2020. He's been heavily involved in the current enterprise agreement dispute. He's also a leading activist in the solidarity movement with Palestine in Sydney. As with all our speakers, Damien is here speaking in a personal capacity. He's going to be telling us his views. Please welcome him. Thanks, Moira. Um, yeah, as Moira set the scene, I think uh, it's important to sort of look at the context we're in. That Australia is going into the worst inflationary crisis in over 30 years. Already, uh, inflation is rising at 6.1%, uh, as is the highest since the early 1990s recession, and it's that is just the beginning. It's tipped to get even worse by the end of the end of the year. And this crisis has been driven by the capitalist class, rapaciously trying to increase their profits by driving up prices and passing on the cost of the global economic situation and the pandemic onto the working class. This coupled with low wage growth has meant that today workers are facing the biggest assault on their wages, real wages, um, in decades. Right now, workers earn no more than what they did 10 years ago. Um, their wages are equivalent to their, what they were in 2011. So a decade of workers fighting to increase their incomes, increase kind of what they can what they get from work to be able to live and thrive has been wiped out by the capitalist class. And this is at the same time that capitalists have been posting booming profits. There's a sharpening class war in Australia. The capitalist class are trying to make workers pay for the crisis. But what's inspiring about the current situation is that um, workers are refusing uh, to have their wages gutted and lie, uh, refusing to lie down in the face of their wages being gutted, particularly in New South Wales in the public sector and the university sector. People are furious about years of stagnant wages and a state government that will hand out billions to property developers um, and big businesses that will grant massive pay rises to senior government bureaucrats and their personal staffers, but at the same time is hell-bent on trying to deliver re real wage cuts, some of the biggest real wage cuts in decades, to the essential workers that keep this state running. And it's a reflection of this anger um, at these attacks 
uh, on our livelihoods that we've seen more strikes and industrial action in the last year than we've seen for over a decade in this state. So since September, railway workers, um, which I'm one, there's a bunch of my comrades here as well, um, uh, have walked off the job three times uh, in the last 12 months, as well as taken a range of industrial action, um, bans and uh, yeah, other forms of industrial action in a campaign to demand better conditions in the workplace, safety on the railways um, and a fair pay rise. This, along with um, massive mobilisations of teachers and nurses in multiple strikes, has put class politics back on the agenda across New South Wales. So often you hear from the media that strikes and unionism are a thing of the past, that we're all middle class now, the working class doesn't exist. Well, I think sort of the strike campaigns and the massive uh, mobilisations of public sector workers has put class politics back on the agenda and shown that the working class um, still has a massive power to change the world. Railway workers alone wield massive industrial power. A huge part of the state's workforce rely on rail public transport just to get to work every day. Up to a million travel on the rail network every day. A single day strike means a huge part of the state's workforce can't get to work and can't make profits to the bosses. It's estimated, and the government continues wheeling out these kind of figures every time to say how horrific it is whenever we take industrial action, but actually whenever I hear it, I think it's how it shows how powerful we are. Um, <laughs> day strike would cost the state economy over a hundred million dollars. <laughs> and that's the kind of power that we have to win the fight for better pay, for better conditions and safety at work. It's also inspiring that this struggle is breaking out all across the world. Railway workers in Sydney are constantly looking at the strike wave that's happening in Britain. Um, being led by public sector unions, especially the railways union, the RMT. Workers across the world are going through the same struggles and especially in places like Britain, um, which is facing an even sharper crisis than what we're seeing in Australia, where the cost of living has already hit 11% per year, where people have had years of pay, um, pay freezes um, imposed by the Tory government during the COVID crisis. British railway workers have taken four 24-hour national strikes in the last month, and they just yesterday, I believe, um, announced another round of national strikes which will be happening in the next couple of weeks. And it puts pay to the lie that often is peddled out, unfortunately often by um, people who lead our unions, that the public will get scared away or the public is put off by us taking industrial action or whenever you take strikes. Actually, every time British Railways have gone on strike, public support has increased for their demands. And we've seen that here in New South Wales as well. Every time the teachers have gone out, every time the nurses have gone out, every time railway workers have gone out, a majority of people have come out like there's been huge public support in favour of it. It's one of the reasons why they actually, you might have noticed, they've never published any polls around what people think about the strikes over the last year. They did that four years ago when we had our campaign in 2018. And even with all the demonisation that was going on, 75% of people said, like, oh yeah, we support the train drivers going on. <laughs> <laughs> so they let that lesson and they just like pretend that they uh, that, the, that people support them, but we know that's bullshit. Um, this fight as well by public sector unions, I think, um, can have a massive impact on the confidence and combativity of the whole Australian working class. Because it's not just public sector workers who are facing the crunch of their, uh, the economic crisis that we're going into, or facing attacks on their wages and their conditions. But public sector workers, because, I mean, just because of the position they are, often uh, have much better history of union organisation, um, can feel a bit more secure, and like I think are leading the way in terms of showing like that you can fight uh, to defend your, you can actually fight to improve your wages and conditions even in this context. So a victory for one, any one of the unions that you know we're part of today would be a massive boost in the confidence for workers everywhere. And I think it's set an example for the kind of struggles that we need to see generalised into every single workplace in the country. Everyone knows the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. They know that there's massive amounts of wealth getting hoarded into a tiny, a smaller and smaller number of exceptionally rich individuals. The way we challenge this is by looking to class politics. 
to the politics of struggle and the power we have as workers to win back the wealth that they've taken from us. I think it's also important that we address the point about the Labor Party. Because in New South Wales, like, for most of the unions that have been involved in uh, you know, strike campaigns, the main enemy is the Liberal government. Um, but I think we have to recognise that the Labor Party is not our friend either. So Federal Treasurer Jim Chalmers, like the new Federal Labor government, has recently come out um, quite prominently in the face of rising inflation. And instead of promising to legislate higher wages for workers or to uh, get rid of the restrictions on the right to strike and allow workers to sort of freely, without the threat of fines um, or punishment, go and use their industrial muscle to fight for better wages and conditions, he said that workers shouldn't expect to have real wage rises for at least a few years. And for the good of the economy, we'll have to suffer pain uh, until inflation just magically declines in the future. This really shows that the Labor Party really cares about profits for the capitalist class, not for workers. And in this, even like also similarly in the state, uh, state parliament, the New South Wales leader of the ALP, Chris Mims, has so far shamefully refused to support unions' demand for above inflation pay rises. Instead, they say that they'll abolish the wages cap, but they'll replace it with productivity bargaining. I think we have to be really clear what this is. This is about holding workers to ransom and demand that they give up conditions in return for measly pay increases. During the last round of industrial action that railway workers were taking uh, about three weeks ago, Mins disgracefully actually lined up with the New South Wales State Government saying that our oh, union's probably going a bit too far, they should probably stop taking industrial action and just sit down and talk with the Minister. Um, absolutely disgraceful. And also, as we get closer to the state election, it's very likely that the leadership of public sector unions will try and turn these industrial campaigns into campaigns just to elect a Labor government into the New South Wales uh, Parliament on the promises that Labor will deliver. This is a recipe for defeat, and I think it's something as union activists will have to combat to say that we have got no, the Labor Party is not our friend, we have no faith in them uh, if they were to get elected in the upcoming election, that they will deliver what we're demanding. Instead, what we have to look to is intensifying our industrial campaigns to fight to win our demands now, um, you know, under the Liberal government, and if we're still having to fight to win them when, when or if Labor gets elected in the next time, then we'll fight just as hard to demand that they deliver real wage rises, um, deliver the conditions that public sector unions are fighting for. So I'm going to finish just by saying that um, uh, railway workers, uh, as of next week, are embarking on another round of industrial action. There's going to be four uh, rolling sort of stoppages happening over the next three weeks. Um, hopefully, we cause like massive disruption in the uh, in the railways again. Um, but what we need to go look to to go forward is not only intensifying that industrial action, putting aside the politics of saying that our demands are won by sitting down and negotiating with the boss. But they're won by us causing economic damage to the bosses. They're won by us um, taking industrial action that brings the state economy to a halt. The power that workers have by cutting off the flow of profits to the bosses is the way that workers have won everything that we have. And we're only going to win these campaigns if we continue to intensify industrial action, if we link up every public sector union to be taking combined actions together so that hopefully we can bring down this government through our industrial muscle, not just by trying to like weekly, you know, uh, pander to a potential Labor government. And that we can set an example for workers everywhere that even in this economic period, you can fight and win uh, above inflation pay rises, real wage growth, safer workplaces, uh, and better conditions if you organise and you fight together. Yeah. So our second speaker is Nathaniel Mitchell. And Nathaniel has worked as a registered nurse at the Prince of Wales Hospital in Randwick for seven years and has been a delegate for the branch of the New South Wales Nurses and Midwife Association there since 2018. And Nathaniel recently moved an amendment at the special general meeting of the NSWMA to raise the union's play claim to 7%. <laughs> Government offer of 2.53%. Okay. 
shame. This amendment was passed at the meeting and then again by the branches of the association by an even bigger margin. <laughs> Tool to convince 
uh, the government to move negotiations forward. But for revolutionary socialists, fighting the bosses and fighting the government is both the whole point of having unions in the first place and the only way we know we can actually win our demands now and in the long term. The New South Wales Nurses and Midwives Association has had a campaign for ratios for over a decade. We have had a public sector wages cap in this state for over a decade. And it wasn't until we and other workers in the public sector took serious strike action that the situation on either of those fronts started to change and that our demands could no longer be ignored by the government. I hope that by now I've made it pretty clear that the leadership of the Nurses and Midwives Association and I have very different strategies for the union movement. <laughs> different strategies for how we are going to actually win our demands. And if I had not moved my amendment, the association would have, if somewhat begrudgingly, accepted the government's offer of 2.5%. 5-3% and no nurse patient ratios. One of the union officials said to me directly, we would be, we, the union, would be accepting the offer because we have to. And that is the important difference in our approaches because I don't believe that we have to. And we don't have to give up and we can fight instead. And our different strategies for the union movement flow directly from the fact that the leadership of the association and I also have very different strategies for changing the world more generally. They think that we can be patient, be reasonable, and ask the powers that be to throw us some crumbs whenever they feel so inclined. And they think that that is enough. And I know that there is something fundamentally wrong with how the world is structured now that there is a tiny, tiny minority of people getting rich and powerful off the backs of the work of the vast majority of people. And importantly, I know that we will only win anything off of those people if we demand it and use our collective power as workers to fight for it. Yeah. And I want to say a quick thing about unity. Um, that there is a difference in strategy between myself and the union leadership is not in and of itself a bad thing. There can be a lot of talk in the union movement about how we need to, at the very least, seem united as an organisation. But actually, I think unity for unity's sake is not a goal we should be striving towards. If you say that you want unity at all costs, you are really saying that you will not fight for your position, but you want me to agree with you anyway. And I'm going to call bullshit on that because I am willing to fight for, my fight for my position and if that means that I am not in complete unity, in complete lockstep with the union officials, well so fucking be it. Yeah. So needless to say, the union officials were not thrilled with our amendment passed. Um, and in the following weeks, under the guise of technical issues with the vote, it was voted by Aaron now. A new vote was called for every branch in the state to reaffirm the amendment. Now I will say, I want to be clear that this vote was unnecessary. It was undemocratic. A mass meeting that all members were eligible to attend had already voted in favour. And there is nothing more democratic in a union than a mass meeting of all members. However, every vote in the union, every fight is an opportunity to make political arguments and win people to your side. I have to say myself and Declan grab that opportunity with both hands. There are 120 branches in the New South Wales Nurses and Midwives Association and we knew from the outset that we wouldn't be able to reach someone in every single one of those branches, unfortunately. But when the union leadership said that I could write a paragraph outlining why I moved the amendment with 12 hours notice, <laughs> and they would circulate it to all members, I made sure to argue as clearly and convincingly as I could in that little paragraph. We also spoke to as many people um, individually as we could from around the state, and when my branch came up, vote came up, I took that little paragraph, I turned it into a leaflet, and I went around from ward to ward, around 14 wards in total, talking to people one-on-one -on -one about why they should vote in favour, 
and convincing them to pass the message on to their co-workers on the next shift. I received not a single negative response to that argument on the wards. <laughs> and my leaf would come to places in the hospital that I have never even been. <laughs> and I am also proud to say that we smashed that second vote. <laughs> All of the branch votes that I know of were over 60% in favour, some over, including my branch and Declan's branch over 70% in favour. And over the last two days, I have heard about multiple votes that were over 90% in favour. <laughs> we have also built connections in other branches across the state that simply would not have been possible if we had not moved our amendment and fought this fight. Um, and I have had people I have never met before coming up to me at the Union's annual conference and thanking me for moving the amendment. Because actually, this is something that people want to fight around. And I think the success of the vote is not only down to the work that Declan and I did, but it does speak to the fact that our amendment tapped into a real anger and desire to fight the government that already existed among union members across New South Wales. Nurses and midwives across the state have been inspired by the massive strikes that we held in February and March of this year. And they don't just want to slink away. They want to keep fighting. Yeah. And the fight continues. Declan and I have, have been, as I mentioned, at the New South Wales Nurses and Midwives Association um, Association's annual conference today and yesterday. And I spoke to the conference today to ask the union leadership well, we've been clear, we want ratios, and we want a real pay rise. So when is our next strike? Yeah. Yeah. The union officials responded that we need to be strategic about when we announce the date. But I have it on good authority that there will be action of some kind in about a month's time. So look out for that. So to conclude, if you take anything away from my talk tonight, I want it to be this. There is nothing special about me, nothing special about Declan, that meant that we were able to put up this amendment and win this fight. Except that I have the revolutionary politics to know that not only are we able to put up a real fight as workers to win our demands, but we must put up that fight if we are going to actually win. Yeah. And I had the confidence and determination to not only see the opportunity that was there, but also to not back down when people, including the top leadership of my union, disagreed. And most importantly, I was, and I am, willing to fight for, for this demand, for all of our demands, for as long and as hard as it required to win. And I hope that this win in the New South Wales Nurses and Midwives Association inspires you to do the same with your fights. is Alma. She works as an administrator at the University of Sydney and has been an active unionist in the National Tertiary Education Union for over a decade. She's led three strike campaigns. <laughs> including the one happening now. And in, since 2020, she has led a rank and file caucus called NTEU Fight Back, whose aim is to push the union in a more militant direction, as well as reclaim democratic control of, our, of the union. This group was central to defeating the, uh, the jobs protection framework in 2020, which would have meant pay cuts and redundancies across universities proposed by the union, and establishing the strikes at UCID in semester one this year. Recently, she's been forcing the union to peg the wage claim to above inflation. Please make a mark. Thank you, Maura. I'll just put the camera on. Okay, hello, comrades. Um, I'm Alma, uh, I'm an admin worker at the University of Sydney and as Maura mentioned, I've been uh, working here for more than a decade. I've been an activist, uh, active socialist and trade unionist the whole time. 
Um, and I've actually taken my union work very seriously, not just because I'm a socialist, uh, it's because I truly believe that workers deserve dignity in the workplace and I want to play my part in rebuilding the Australian union movement. So in my decade at Sydney Uni, um, I've been involved in a number of uh, uh, campaigns to save jobs, to uh, stop speed ups, for workers to have dignity in the workplace, like the right to have a pot plant or a family photo <laughs> on your desk, to defend health and safety uh, conditions. I've led strikes, I've led protests, I've penned open letters, um, and if I don't know this for sure, but I think I'm on some kind of list somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can also confirm that uh, one of the favourite insults for me uh, from my rivals is that I'm unreasonable. <laughs> Opportunity, and what I mean by that <clears throat> is that with every single injustice that the bosses dish out to us, it's an opportunity to make arguments about the importance of unionism and the importance of collective action. And by extension, as my comrades have introduced earlier, uh, it's an it's an ex opportunity to make an argument why capitalism is a system that has to go. It's a system based on the profit motive that prioritizes. Um, profits uh, over human lives. Very good example is what's happening right now with the pandemic globally. In Australia, we've had more than uh, 7,000 last count, probably more deaths uh, thanks to COVID in the, la in the first few months of this year. I wanted to just quickly um, talk about two issues that I recently have had a victory over. Um, and mostly just as examples of the kind of uh, union organising that I've uh, led in the workplace. So, they might seem small, but I think that they're essential uh, to building long-term union presence and power. The first one has been a long-standing WHS issue uh, um, over air quality in our building. So since the bushfires, and even before our building uh, has been plagued by poor air quality, we're in an open plan office, the aircon often breaks down and we can't open the windows. In 2019, this issue escalated when the bushfires happened and smoke uh, filled the office. And we were essentially expected to just sit there and work in this smoke. We kicked up a fuss and were able to work from home, etc. But then only a couple of months later, the COVID crisis happened. So we went from being exposed to potentially toxic smoke actually definitely toxic smoke, <laughs> to a potentially deadly uh, virus. And so the fight for the workplace health and safety uh, cu culminated in us pushing for things like an air purifier as one of the measures to address the air quality issue. We pressured management through arguments in meetings, uh, writing letters, etc. Um, and I just wanted to confirm that recently we want a massive air purifier in our office. And I also wanted to give a shout out to my NTU uh, fight back fellow troublemaker and colleague Nicole McDougall who's in this room. <laughs> and I also just wanted to say one of the reasons, so it looks like the air purifier thing took several years and in a way it did but part of the reason is that is actually due to the fact that our office, because we are unionised in Bolshe, weren't actually forced back. When most offices on campus were forced back to the office, we actually weren't because every time they tried, we had a massive fight about it. <laughs> so the air purifier thing could have happened earlier had they tried to force us or whatever. Um, the second victory we just had yesterday, people might have seen on Facebook, uh, it was. Um, against an attempt by student centre management to split lunch breaks into two 30 minute uh, time blocks. An absolute outrage. The excuse given was that management needs staff uh, on duty essentially uh, during peak period. 
to put this in context, peak period at Junior Center is like all the time. <laughs> Whenever there's some kind of email that goes out and there's a spike in inquiry, suddenly it's peak period. So it would actually have impacted people for months and months and months of the year. We uh, got, yeah, first we got outraged um, and the directive was issued on a Friday afternoon. The roster was operational that Monday. I quickly contacted the delegate there and uh, organized an open letter and got over 100 signatures in a matter of hours. Yes. Yes. We requested a meeting with management, uh, laid out the arguments and presented the letter and they swiftly backed down. Yes. I've just picked a couple of these issues to highlight the importance of fighting on, on Issues that don't seem as important as, like, say, a wage rise or fighting 200 job cuts, etc. But because there's actually no shortcuts to rebuilding the confidence that workers need to take those larger actions. It's a stitch-by-stitch -stitch approach, um, and I think no injustice is too small an organising opportunity. And obviously, when you, in the process of organising, you actually find out who your true allies are, who's willing to take a stand with you, who's willing to stick their neck out, like sign your open letter or whatever, or, and, and then who's willing to ask others to sign, etc., etc. But the biggest campaign I've been involved in started in 2020. The COVID-19 crisis hit the Australian higher education sector more than others. Uh, the bosses used it as an excuse to carry out uh, job cuts and productivity increases that they wanted to do previously, but now they had a really good excuse. The borders were closed to thousands of fee-paying international students and for some universities this meant a loss of projected revenue and others actual revenue. In any case, they had an excuse. A debate ensued in the sector about who should pay for the crisis. Unfortunately, our union's leadership agreed that it should be workers. In 2020, I found myself leading a fight against my own union who had devised a wage-cutting deal to help universities uh, weather the storm of COVID. The scheme is now famously known as the Jobs Protection Framework, or JPF for short. The proposal was that if university workers accept a wage cut of up to 15%, which amounts to hundreds of dollars each week, that we would basically get to keep our jobs. The Job Protection Framework was devised during secret negotiations without consultation with the membership between some of the country's richest employers and the national leadership of our union. Shame. Shame. The JPF is actually the biggest sellout in our union's history, though I'm not sure it's going to be the last, <laughs> with the current leadership. So stay tuned. Um, <laughs> but the attempt to roll it out actually also caused the biggest revolt in our union's history and one of the biggest rank and file revolts in general union history as far as I'm aware. So previously members' meetings were uh, well attended if we got, say, 100 people. The JPF debates drew me uh, members' meetings of up to 400 and sometimes more in places um, and became sites of acrimony and a hostile debate between the left and right representatives of the union. Out of the Jobs Protection Framework debate, the rank and file caucus NTU Fight Back was born. <laughs> And this is actually what I want to spend the rest of my talk on um, because I think it's quite a unique grouping as far as the state of our unions is concerned. Uh, NT Fiveback was formed, uh, it was, the formation was led by social alternative comrades who work in the higher education sector um, and it has expanded to various campuses since then. Um, when we heard about the JPF uh, framework, we set out on one mission and that was to defeat it. As committed unionists, there was no way that we were going to allow a wage cut of up to 15% be delivered to the membership without opposition. Um, because the JPF was to be voted upon nationally, we set out to run a vote no campaign. We set up meetings on Zoom during lockdowns uh, that drew hundreds. We penned an open letter calling for the scrapping of the uh, JPF and moved and debated motions both nationally and in local meetings. This was the biggest campaign any of us had been involved in up to that point. Fast forward two years later, I'm happy to say that the 
massive fast we kicked up is one of the key reasons that the JPF failed as a national strategy. Um, and it initially it was to be rolled out at pretty much every campus, which is around 40 campuses across the country. It ended up being rolled out at about half a dozen and simply because the union mobilized the entirety of their resources uh, for essentially selling this fee campaign that if you don't accept a wage cut, you're going to lose your job. So you know, naturally a lot of uh, members, especially where there was not much opposition that was organized, voted for it. But I'm very proud to say that we played a key role in defeating it as a national strategy. Since then, uh, I, this, I'm running out of time, I've just realized. Uh, so I will try to fast forward to a bit about stuff at usage. Um, one of the key achievements is just the very existence of an NTU fight back. Uh, we call it you know, rank and file caucus, essentially meaning a group of uh, workers who are not uh, in charge of the union but are ordinary members but want to shape the direction of the union in a more progressive way. We've played a central role in trying to make the EBA campaign a more combative, militant campaign for uh, wages and conditions. Um, and we have largely succeeded in setting the tone of debate on pretty much every single issue. Two key achievements, um, Jeremy mentioned at the start and other comrades uh, were here with us on the pickets, but um, the strikes that we had in semester one would, would pr just simply would not have happened in the way that they did without NTU Fight Back. Yeah. Um, not only did the strikes happen uh, to the extent that they did, i.e. 48 hours to kick off with then another 24 hour strike focusing on First Nations issues two weeks later. Initially it was actually a debate whether or not we even have strikes, yeah. whether we have strikes yeah. or meaningless ineffective actions like administration bans. Thank God we intervened because UCD is a leading site and has an impact on the rest of the sector. Um, the second thing that I think is a really important achievement of NTU Fight Back, apart from um, leading the uh, opposition um, to concessionary unionism, is our fight for an increased wage claim. So people might not realize this, but initially our wage claim was a significant pay cut. It was 12%. Uh, we penned an open letter asking for it to be increased we kept the pressure up. We kept um, we kept the pressure up. We kept going and managed to force the national executive to increase the wage claim to CPI plus 1.5. Yeah. So just to put this in uh, real terms, basically, if inflation is 6.1 percent, we're asking for at least 6.1 percent plus 1.5 on top. That's actually higher than most industries at the moment. And we're asking for this every single year. Um, so pegging a wage claim to inflation is important because it means that if inflation continues to rise, our wages can actually keep up with it. Um, okay, I need to wind up, but I think it's worth just drawing out a couple of political lessons. It's very obvious what kind of unionism um, myself and NTU Fiber comrades um, are fighting for, it is no concessions. We don't think that pressures, conditions that were um, fought for over generations should be traded off for false promises of things like job security. And sometimes they're just traded off and not, like we don't get it in return either. Yeah. You know? So that's, in, that's disgraceful. So I think we're playing a really important role um, in maintaining that tradition of what, what does true militant unionism look like? Um, I think it's been uh, absolutely essential that we, as Nat mentioned, um, that we don't just go along with the flow for the sake of unity. We think it is important to have an oppositional voice. We think it's important to have debate uh, because actually when the, when the other people in the union talk about unity, what they're talking about is papering over critical political differences that um, would actually just silence the left. Um, so I'm going to yeah, wind it up there, but I guess one question is how did I manage to build NTU Fight Back? Because I'm extremely proud of NTU Fight Back. I know that it's a small group, we're a small group, but we are contesting in a very important political place and we have had a huge impact um, at UCID but also nationally by extension because UCID is, is a leading side. I think one simple way to say it is that 
Um, I just follow people around. <laughs> I, when I'm in a meeting and I make an argument and someone's nodding, I will follow that person after the meeting and be like, hey, you agree with me. Like, what do you think about XYZ? So, yeah, I'm a stalker. Um, and as Nicole would know, working with me in the office, I, I follow people to the tea room. Um, I'm always making cups of tea and the purpose of this. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I'm constantly political at work. I like to hear what workers, colleagues are saying, and I like to basically fan the flames of discontent. So if someone shows a bit of life in them, I am right there. Um, and I think just like clarifying after every single meeting and debate and uh, you know conflict with management or, or conflict you know within union meetings, clarifying it, the lines of debate and what it means for us and our fight for, yeah, a better uh, workplace, etc. So, yeah, I'm going to wind it up there because I think people would rather probably talk more in the discussion, but just to say that I think we need to replicate this kind of rank and file caucus or this kind of uh, rebellion in every single union because we do need to be organised and the forces we're dealing with are not just management, but unfortunately they are you know, more often than not, our own union officials uh, who have just a different role in society, which, which we can go through in the discussion. But they do play a negative role often, like, you know, in setting expectations, uh, lowering them, actually. And I think that's one of the barriers that we need to overcome. And the way to overcome it, I think, is to build our own oppositional forces. So I'll just leave it there.